The story is set in 16th century Korea. During this tumultuous time, the Korean society is in turmoil with constant wars, and the ruling power of the Joseon dynasty is controlled by powerful families. The common people suffer greatly, struggling to even afford a meal. Within the walls of the royal palace, the deceased king's mouth is filled with drugs and fresh blood. A silver needle is inserted into his forehead, and a white smoke envelopes his body. Miraculously, the king awakens, but his eyes have turned white, indicating that he is no longer a normal human. He becomes a bloodthirsty creature, attacking anyone he encounters and breaking free from the iron chains that bind him. The ministers are terrified and retreat in fear. The transformation of the once noble king is the result of a conspiracy orchestrated by the prime minister, Cho Hak Jo. The prime minister's son is the commander of the royal guard, with control over the movement of palace personnel. His daughter is the queen, already pregnant. If she gives birth to a male child, the prime minister can secure his position as the rightful ruler. Before the child's birth, the king dies, and according to the rules, the crown prince, Li Chang, should ascend the throne. However, Cho Hak Jo, determined to hold onto power, summons the royal physician, An Hyun, to revive the king using a resurrecting herb, known as the resurrection plant, until the queen gives birth. Unbeknownst to him, the queen is not actually pregnant. It is a ruse to secure power. She keeps dozens of pregnant women in her palace, providing them with luxurious meals. Her plan is to claim one of their newborn boys as her own. On this day, An Hyun and his apprentice are called to diagnose the king. An Hyun warns his apprentice not to look up while treating the king. As they approach the palace, they hear beast-like sounds and a foul stench emanating from within. Curiosity gets the better of the apprentice, and he looks up only to be immediately grabbed by a gigantic hand and pulled inside the palace. With eerie screams echoing through the palace, the atmosphere becomes increasingly sinister. The following day, hundreds of notices written in blood appear on the streets of the capital, clearly stating that the king has died and a new king should be enthroned. Mu Yong, the commander-in-chief in charge of investigating the case, is ruthless and merciless. He swiftly kills the patrolling guards without hesitation, in a society where literacy is scarce. And considering the meticulous planning behind this large-scale operation, it is evident that there are political motives at play. Mu Yang takes the initiative to capture all the students from nearby academies and subjects them to brutal torture. However, none of the students reveal any clues. Finally, one student, unable to endure the pain, speaks up and reveals his true sentiments. He asserts that the greatest villain in this dynasty is not them, the weak scholars, but rather the corrupt and greedy nobles who wield power. He specifically points out Prime Minister Jo Hak Jo. At that moment, Jo Hak Jo emerges from his house. He orders the imprisonment of all the scholars and demands confessions. He declares that anyone involved in spreading rumors will be executed without mercy. He interrogates the kidnapped students, inquiring if the Crown Prince instructed their actions, as it would benefit him the most. The Crown Prince, Li Chang, kneels outside the Queen's palace, pleading for an audience with the King. However, the Queen, once again using the King's illness as an excuse, rejects him, aware that the Joseon dynasty is on the brink of change. The Crown Prince realizes he cannot sit idly by, he must learn about the King's current condition, or else death awaits him. He sends his guard, Mu Yong, to steal the king's medical records while he sneaks into the palace under cover of night to investigate. The silent palace feels eerie, with beast-like screams echoing through the corridors, accompanied by a foul stench. As the approaching creature draws nearer, Li Chang grasps his sword for self-defense. Just as the monster reaches the door, the lights suddenly go out, intensifying his anxiety. Slowly, he opens the door to check, only to find Mu Yang, the commander-in-chief, undeterred. Li Chang breaks into the king's chamber, only to encounter Prime Minister Zhou Hakjo standing there, powerless to confront him directly. Li Chang retreats to his own chamber for the time being. Fortunately, on the other side, his guard retrieves the king's medical records, but there were only a few simple pages in it, and the rest were completely blank like white paper. This clearly indicated that something significant was being concealed. To make matters more suspicious, guard Mu Yang discovered that the royal physician who treated the king was on Hyun, who had resigned and returned home three years ago. Li Chang immediately decided to go to Dongmi and find An Hyun to get some answers. Meanwhile, on the other side, An Hyun returned to the medical clinic carrying a coffin. He had built this clinic for the homeless people. Due to the government's inaction, famine had struck Korea, and many people were suffering from a plague while unable to afford even a full meal. When the people saw physician An Hyun returning, 
They approached him with confusion, wondering what had happened and why only one person came back instead of two. However, when they opened the coffin and looked inside, they all stepped back in shock. Lying inside was An Hyun's disciple, whose body appeared to have been devoured by a wild beast. Master An Hyun instructed his disciple, Seo Bai, to prepare for the funeral. Seo Bai, who was unaware of what had happened, hurriedly caught up with her master to ask what had transpired in the palace. Her master merely glanced at her without saying a word and turned to enter the house. Meanwhile, Crown Prince Li Chang was rushing towards Dongni with his guards. Only the royal physician, An Hyun, could provide him with the answers he sought. He needed to obtain evidence to rescue the Confucian scholars imprisoned in the jail. The next day, Seo Bai went to the mountains as usual to gather wild vegetables. However, she found that all the wild vegetables had already been eaten, and only tree roots remained. Reluctantly, she started digging. When she returned to the village in a hurry, she noticed smoke rising from the medical clinic. She felt frustrated, wondering if there was anything left to eat. She hurriedly returned to the clinic. To her surprise, she found the people inside the clinic not only had meat soup to drink but were also eating meat with big bites. Witnessing everything before her eyes, Seo Bai felt like she was in a dream, realizing what was happening. She immediately rushed into the kitchen and saw Yangshin tending to the fire. Yangshin told her that he had hunted a wild deer in the mountains himself. However, Seo Bai knew very well that there was no edible food left in the mountains, let alone deer, but despite her hunger, she didn't think much and served herself a bowl. Enticed by the aroma of the meat coming from the pot, suddenly, a dropped finger startled her, and she screamed in horror, realizing that the people were eating human flesh. She rushed into the courtyard and saw people devouring the meat with large bites, unsure of what to do. At that moment, she noticed Yan Shin, the deserter, sitting nearby and not eating, knowing that all of this was Yan Shin's idea. She grabbed him by the collar and took him to the storeroom. She questioned how he could be so cruel as their deceased junior disciple was their family member. Now being consumed by people, Yang Shin argued back, stating that the situation had reached such an extreme point. Once a person dies, they are merely a shell. Since the government no longer cared about them, shouldn't they try to survive on their own? While the two engaged in a heated argument, a violent change occurred outside the door. The medical staff and patients who had just consumed human flesh began to vomit and convulse, making wild animal-like noises from their mouths. In less than three minutes, the entire medical clinic was filled with lifeless bodies. The girl, understanding the situation, walked out slowly. She noticed one of the men still foaming at the mouth and on the verge of death. She immediately approached and attempted to save him by stuffing a white cloth into his mouth. Unbeknownst to her, a corpse behind her inexplicably stood up. With a scream, the two who had been arguing in the storeroom heard the commotion. Yang Shin was about to go out and investigate but was knocked down by an unseen force. Blood seeped through the door crack, and as they looked through it, they saw that the medical clinic had turned into a living hell. The female physician who had been treating others had become food for the zombies. The next day, the crown prince and his guards had arrived near Dongni. They entered a deep mountain, and the crown prince sensed something abnormal. The entire mountain was eerily quiet. Not even a single mosquito or bird chirping, they quickly found the residence of the physician on Hyun, but the medical clinic was already in ruins. As they entered to investigate, they discovered that both the roof and the courtyard were filled with sharpened bamboo poles, stained with blood, as if to prevent some kind of creature from escaping. They entered the rooms of the medical clinic to inspect, finding them equally dilapidated. Accidentally, Li Chang stepped on a wooden board, causing it to break and fall to the ground. It was then that he realized the floor was filled with corpses, intertwined like twisted ropes. They immediately called local officials, who came and removed all the bodies, taking them back to the government office and arranging them in a row. However, after examining their identities, they discovered that the royal physician on Hyun was not among them. To investigate what had happened in the medical clinic, the two of them went to nearby residents to inquire. They heard from a hunter that there were survivors in the medical clinic. After the incident, he had seen the physician Seo Bai running into the mountains, following the lead. They found Seo Bai in a cave. Li Chang asked her about the whereabouts of the royal physician on Hyun. However, Seo Bai revealed that everyone had died in the disaster that night. From their conversation, Seo Bai also learned that all the bodies in the medical clinic had been removed. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, she hurriedly ran back. But Li Chang stopped her. He informed her about the medical records left behind by their master documenting a plant called life death grass that could treat the current symptoms. That's why she had hidden in the mountains, hoping to find the life death grass to save people. But now there was no time. 
she had to immediately go back and stop the officials from releasing the bodies. Meanwhile, Yang Xin, who had returned from chopping firewood, also discovered that all the bodies in the medical clinic were gone. He had done it with good intentions, wanting to feed people so they wouldn't go hungry, but he hadn't anticipated that it would lead to the death of everyone in the medical clinic. He rushed into the government office and warned everyone that the bodies would soon wake up and bite people, they must be quickly locked back up. The leading magistrate considered him a madman and was about to arrest him. Seo Bai, who had arrived after hearing the news, knelt before the magistrate and desperately explained that what Yang Shen had said was true. Once the sun sets, these people will revive, and they will bite anyone they see. Seeing that sunset was imminent, she urged everyone to escape quickly, however, the magistrate not only didn't believe their words but also suspected them of being responsible for all the deaths in the inn. As a result, he locked them up in the dungeon. Meanwhile, Li Chang also returned to the medical clinic, hoping to find the medical records that Seo Bai mentioned. He had a hunch that his father and the people Seo Bai mentioned had the same symptoms. If he could find the records, the truth would be revealed. But when he arrived at the medical clinic, he found Mu Yang waiting for him. It turned out that they had been secretly monitoring Li Chang's movements and knew he was there to find the royal physician, An Hyun. So they followed him. Without any hesitation, they drew their swords and faced each other. This time, Mu Yang wouldn't show any mercy. His main goal was to kill the crown prince Li Chang to eliminate any future threat. In the fight, Li Chang was clearly no match for Mu Yang and quickly fell in defeat. Just as Mu Yang was about to finish him off, there was a commotion from a box in the room. Mu Yang's subordinate cautiously approached to investigate, but the person who came out of the box bit him directly, and he was none other than the royal physician on Hyun, who Li Chang was searching for. The subordinate was bitten to death on the spot, and on Hyun then pounced on Mu Yang, biting him and causing injury. The crown prince witnessed this scene for the first time and was frozen in place from fear, but as soon as he regained his senses, he quickly picked up a stone and smashed the monster to death. However, Mu Yang, who was bitten, also began to mutate. He stared fiercely at Li Chang and then lunged at him directly. Li Chang hastily picked up a sword from the ground and beheaded him with one strike. At the same time, strange things were happening at the government office. Everyone gathered at the entrance to witness the spectacle. One of the masked men watched in astonishment as the bodies mysteriously started moving. As night fell, to the amazement of the onlookers, the bodies stood up in extremely contorted ways. Among the crowd, a man recognized his own wife among the resurrected bodies and rushed towards her, only to be bitten. All the bodies began to awaken, and the people finally realized the danger and scattered in all directions to escape. Ironically, the prison became the safest place. Hearing the screams from outside, Yanshin knew that the zombies had come back to life. Taking advantage of the guards' inattention, he directly broke open the door and fled. And at this moment, the magistrate was hiding in fear under a wooden plank. Above him, zombies were feasting on people, and blood dripped onto his face. But he was too terrified to make a sound. Meanwhile, the masked man who had just fallen down had also turned into a zombie, leaving the magistrate and others screaming in terror. As they watched the zombies crawling in through the floor, the group quickly crawled to the other side. One of their companions, who was known for overreading, got stuck and became food for the zombies. The entire town had now become the territory of the zombies. They could only seek refuge in the prison, with the zombies closing in on them. However, their companions were too panicked to open the prison door. Fortunately, they managed to open it at the last moment, but one of their companions was bitten on the hand by a zombie while closing the door. Within seconds, the man mutated into a zombie himself. Cho Biam Pal, who had witnessed such a scene before, was too scared and could only hide behind Seo Bai. Fortunately, Seo Bai picked up a knife for self-defense and managed to kill the zombie. In another cell, his longtime roommate had also turned into a zombie. The man screamed in terror, begging for help. Luckily, they were locked on the same wooden plank, and the zombie couldn't reach him for the time being. On the other side, Yang Xin was inside the city, saving the surviving people. They climbed to a higher place together, narrowly escaping the zombies. At that moment, a woman with a child rushed in, and they reached out to pull her up. However, a large group of zombies arrived from behind, and the woman was bitten. She pleaded with them to save her child, so they could only save the child. They watched as the woman became food for the zombies. Meanwhile, the survivors scattered throughout the city, trying to escape. The zombies quickly spread to the surrounding villages. A man hurriedly went to save his elderly father but was bitten when entering the house. In the next moment, he turned into a zombie and attacked his father. Meanwhile, Li Chang, who had escaped from the medical clinic, watched as a raging fire broke out not far from the city. He knew that the entire Dongni had fallen, 
On the river, a small boat floated by, but the boatman had already turned into a zombie. A large group of zombies was charging towards him not far away, and he had no time to think, only managing to escape in a panic. But whether it was the forest or the riverside, they were all filled with zombies. Just as he was about to meet his demise, his guard, Mu Young, arrived in time and saved him. The man prepared to escape on horseback, but the horse was bitten by a zombie, and Mu Young was tackled by a zombie. At a critical moment, Li Chang swiftly decapitated the zombie. Finally, the two of them followed the fleeing villagers to a military camp on the outskirts of the city. However, the gates of the camp were tightly shut, completely disregarding the pleas of the villagers. In order to save their lives, the villagers had no choice but to climb upwards. Meanwhile, the officials inside the camp, driven by self-preservation, ordered the unarmed villagers to be shot with arrows. They even used weapons to drive them away, and even when Crown Prince Li Chang tried to prove his identity, the officials didn't believe him. At the same time, a large horde of zombies rushed towards the crowd from behind, forcing Li Chang to escape once again. Countless people behind him became food for the zombies. Seeing that there was no way forward, Li Chang jumped into the lake. The zombies that followed him slowly sank to the bottom of the lake. Li Chang and the others immediately swam to the shore, and the zombies behind them didn't dare to enter the water. Meanwhile, inside the royal palace in the capital, the king of Joseon was bound by iron chains, clearly turned into a zombie. To stabilize his emotions, they waited until his daughter successfully gave birth. Every day, Joe Hakjo would feed the king a palace maid, and they would submerge the remaining bodies of the consumed king of Joseon into the bottom of the lake. After daybreak, to deceive onlookers, they would have palace maids apply makeup to the consumed king of Joseon. After the sun rose, all the zombies in Dongni seemed to fear the sunlight and climbed into dark places, becoming motionless. Some even jumped into wells, and everything seemed to return to calmness. The little girl hiding in the box slowly emerged, but the streets were already in ruins. The surviving people came out of their hiding places and began to explore their surroundings. The officials who had hidden in the military camp saw Cho Biam Pal, who had survived, and immediately expressed loyalty, claiming to have brought people to rescue him. Subsequently, they blamed all the mistakes on Yang Shin, who relied on Cho Biam Pal, and foolish Cho Biam Pal actually believed them. However, the immediate priority was not punishment but to destroy all the dormant zombies. Otherwise, they would act again once night fell. Siobai told Cho Biam Pal that the only way to stop them was to burn the corpses or decapitate them. This statement was hindered by the mother of the magistrate, whose son had tragically died in the incident. She didn't care about the dead commoners, but her son, as a noble, could not be burned. The officials agreed with her, and they expressed their opinions on the inept Cho Biam Pal. They can burn the commoners but bury the nobles deep underground. At that moment, Li Chang, who walked among the crowd, voiced his opposition, stating that the safety of the people should be the priority. He then walked straight towards the officials and slapped one of them across the face. Leaving the official bewildered, Li Chang wasted no time and revealed his identity token. Upon seeing the four-clawed dragon symbol, Cho Biam Pal immediately recognized Li Chang as the crown prince and knelt down. The officials realized the gravity of their actions and pleaded for mercy. Considering the urgent need for manpower, Li Chang spared the officials' lives for now, with the intention to hold them accountable once everything was resolved. He inquired about the remaining military strength and learned that there were fewer than 50 soldiers left. He dispersed the people to search for and arrange the bodies, then gathered them for a mass cremation. After completing these tasks, Li Chang immediately returned to the medical clinic to search for the medical records left by the royal physician. Upon discovering information about the resurrection plant, he speculated that his father, the king, had already passed away. He suspected that Zhou Hakjo had used the resurrection plant to create the illusion of his father being alive. Now armed with the information about Seo Bai and the resurrection plant, Li Chang possessed substantial evidence. He needed a suitable ally to proceed. Li Chang planned to go to Anju to find his mentor, on Haiyan. Unbeknownst to him, the officials themselves, by offending the crown prince, were destined to meet their demise sooner or later. They began persuading Cho Biam Pal to secretly escape by boat. Taking advantage of the crown prince's ignorance, they fled with a group of officials and nobles. They showed no concern for the lives of the commoners on the shore, who cried for help. As they disappeared without a trace, it was only when the crown prince arrived at the dock that he learned the officials had not followed his instructions to cremate all the bodies, to safeguard the surviving commoners. Li Chang decided to lead the group back to the medical clinic. As it had some fencing for protection, they hurried towards the medical clinic together. However, along the way, a young girl discovered in horror that the rocks concealed corpses underneath. With daylight fading, 
They had to quicken their pace, or they would become fodder for the zombies. Unforeseen events always occur, and as the group hastened towards the medical clinic, a carriage became stuck on a stone. All the people on the carriage were elderly, weak, sick, or disabled. At the same time, the nearby corpses began to stir. Mu Young, sensing the danger, wanted to persuade the crown prince to leave first. However, the crown prince was unwilling to abandon the people, as it would make him no different from Joe Hakjo and his accomplices. With everyone's combined effort, they managed to lift the carriage out and rushed towards the medical clinic swiftly. They encountered constant zombie attacks along the way. But fortunately, at the critical moment, they arrived at the medical clinic just before the horde of zombies closed in. This saved their lives. They immediately blocked the entrance of the clinic with objects and, once they had calmed down, the crown prince took charge and commanded everyone. The women, children, elderly, and infirm were all hidden in the warehouse, while those capable of fighting armed themselves and guarded the last line of defense. Meanwhile, on the other side, Cho Beam Pal and the officials were happily eating on the boat. Unaware of the impending danger, unbeknownst to them, the mother of the magistrate, who had boarded the ship with them, secretly brought her deceased son on board to prevent his body from being burned. When the people on the boat heard the commotion, they gathered around the cabin door to see what was happening. Suddenly, the magistrate turned into a zombie and charged at them. Chaos erupted on the boat, turning it into a hellish scene. Meanwhile, the people at the medical clinic survived a tense night and finally saw the dawn. They breathed a sigh of relief as they watched the horde of zombies gradually recede. After the incident, everyone was deeply moved by the crown prince's righteousness and gratitude. They all knelt down to express their thanks for his life-saving actions. Li Chang didn't say much but instead assigned people to search for food and treat the injured. He didn't get angry even when children disturbed him and even shared his meager food with them. This scene was observed by Yan Xin, who was sitting nearby. Yang Xin had previously been a deserter, disappointed with the Joseon dynasty. However, seeing Li Chang's sense of justice reignited his hope. When he heard that Li Chang planned to go to Anju, Yang Xin approached him and offered to guide him. Being a native of Anju himself, he knew the way. However, Mu Yong, the bodyguard, was reluctant to trust him because he had witnessed Yang Xin's skills during yesterday's escape. An ordinary civilian wouldn't remain calm and use a firearm to shoot zombies accurately in the forehead. Just as Yang Xin was about to say something, a commotion suddenly came from outside the door. Everyone immediately became alert, thinking that the zombies were attacking again. However, the commotion was soon followed by shouting, accusing Crown Prince Li Chang of being a criminal. He violated the orders of the Korean king and needs to be sent back to the palace for investigation. It turns out that these people are members of the Forbidden Army sent by Prime Minister Jo Hak Jo. Upon receiving news of his son's death, Jo Hak Jo lost his sanity and became determined to avenge his son, believing that Li Chang was responsible for his death. He directly ordered the Forbidden Army to kill Li Chang on sight. The troops outside the door, seeing no movement inside, immediately released a volley of arrows. Many people didn't have time to react and were killed by the arrows, witnessing innocent civilians dying because of him. Li Chang's gaze became even more resolute, realizing that they couldn't sit idly by. They took advantage of the chaos caused by the invading army. Using the smoke as cover, Yang Shen launched an attack. Using a matchlock gun to repel the advancing forbidden army, Li Chang and Mu Yun took the opportunity to escape through the main gate. Mu Yun hid in the forest, using his whistle to confuse the forbidden army, leaving them disoriented. Once everyone settled down, they all headed towards Anju together. Meanwhile, another leader of the pursuing forbidden army received a confidential report, which only said Anju. He immediately ordered his men to light the beacon at Dong Rei. In the capital of Hanyang, people saw the beacon from Dong Rei and thought that the Japanese pirates were attacking again. The Grand Secretary took this opportunity to request an audience with the king, believing that the king had been threatened by Zhou Hak Zhou, preventing them from meeting. However, this time, King Yangzhou directly made way for them, revealing his deranged state. The sight of the king in such a condition frightened the group of ministers, causing them to retreat in fear. Prime Minister Zhou Hakjo took advantage of the situation to explain that the king was suffering from an incurable illness and would soon ascend to heaven. He also revealed that the same disease had broken out in Dong Rei, hence the beacon being lit. Following this, Zhou Hakjo accused the Grand Secretary and his family of treason and executed them. This left Crown Prince Li Chang without his most powerful ally. In the dead of night, Zhou Hakjo entered the Queen's palace with a box. Although the Queen and her father were on the same side, he had secretly killed someone without informing her, which showed a lack of respect. She began to put on a show. But when Zhou Hakjo opened the box, 
He discovered it contained the severed head of his own brother. His previously arrogant demeanor turned into shock. On the other side, Joe Hakjo maintained a serious expression, indicating that he had the power to both elevate her to her position and bring her down from it. They were now in dire straits. So regardless of the circumstances, the queen had to bear a son, otherwise, all their plans would be in vain. He also stated that he would kill the crown prince and anyone related to him, holding the queen's family for the bloodshed of the Li family. On the other side, Li Chang and the others set up camp and rested on their way to Anju. Seo Bai went into the mountains to gather some herbs for future use. However, she constantly felt like someone was following her. But every time she turned around to check, there was no one there. She continued digging for herbs, but soon she felt a cold sensation behind her, as if something was standing right behind her. With one hand holding a hoe and the other slowly reaching for a torch, she finally turned around and let out a scream, which quickly attracted Li Chang and the others. Everyone thought Seo Bai had encountered a zombie, but when Seo Bai ran towards them, they carefully observed and realized that the bloodied and disheveled person following her was Cho Biam Pal. Li Chang got angry at the sight of him and kicked him to the ground. He now wished he could just kill this wretched county magistrate with one swing of his sword. But unexpectedly, why was Cho Biam Pal here? Cho Biam Pal explained the whole situation to the crown prince and revealed that he was the only survivor on the ship. The ship was heading towards Anju, and Li Chang had a bad feeling about it. If a ship full of zombies docked in Anju, the entire city would be in danger. Once Anju fell, zombies would quickly climb over the city walls, and the whole capital of Hanyang would be at risk. There was no time to hesitate. They had to depart immediately and make their way to Anju. At the same time, the ship had conveniently stopped at the border of Anju. Inside the city, life appeared prosperous, although there were rumors of an outbreak outside. Under the governance of Anhyan, Anju remained peaceful and prosperous. People gathered in the streets to worship the deities. Meanwhile, Anhyan was guarding a wake in the mountains, and his subordinates reported the situation of the beacon being lit at Dong Rei. He showed no signs of nervousness. However, when he heard that a strange epidemic was breaking out in Dong Rei, where the infected, even in death, didn't truly die but turned into monsters. On high and paused for a moment but maintained his composure. Clearly, he knew something about the situation. He immediately ceased his current task and made a bold decision. That means the guardians are not allowed to come down the mountain. Shortly after, he received a report that a ship had been found in the river outside Anju. With a team of people, he immediately went to investigate. Since ships were generally state-owned, he guessed that the docking of the ship and the beacon at Dong Rei must be connected. When they arrived at the ship, they found it empty. With all the belongings and valuables gone, the cabin was covered in bloodstains, and they noticed a box inside. Carefully, the men approached the box and opened it, only to find it empty. Except for traces covered in bloodstains, they realized that something unfortunate had happened to the people on the ship. The puzzling question was, where did the dead or injured people go? Meanwhile, on the other side, Li Chang and the others arrived at a small village outside Anju after traveling day and night. Strangely, in this era of rampant undead, the villagers were enjoying roasted meat and drinking alcohol. However, upon seeing Li Chang and the group, they became visibly anxious and quickly withdrew, hiding their food. Li Chang knew something was amiss. When they questioned the villagers, an elderly man hesitated before claiming that they had earned the food through their work. But when Cho Biam Pal saw a woman coming out of a room with the same fabric found on the ship, Everyone understood that the food and supplies they possessed came from that ship. The villagers, caught in their lie, immediately knelt down, confessed their wrongdoing, and revealed everything. They had discovered the stranded ship on the shore. However, when they entered the ship, they found all the people dead, seemingly devoured by large beasts. The bodies were torn apart and in a horrific state. Due to their desire for the ship's provisions and fear of being discovered, they buried the bodies. Li Chang was troubled because he knew that burying the bodies wouldn't stop them. The villagers offered to lead them to a nearby reed marsh. They had to decapitate the buried bodies before sunset to completely stop the threat. Unbeknownst to the desperate group, they failed to notice the villagers' sinister gaze. As they reached an open area, the villagers stopped in their tracks. They brandished weapons at Li Chang's group, knowing that stealing their provisions was a severe crime. Though the villagers had lived long enough, they were willing to silence Li Chang and his companions to conceal their guilt. The guards were infuriated and demanded the villagers put down their weapons, emphasizing the importance of the people standing before them. Roaring with anger, they tried to reason with the villagers. However, the villagers had already made up their minds. In their eyes, only dead men keep secrets. Meanwhile, Li Chang tried to reason with the villagers, 
telling them that there was something more important than the crime of stealing provisions. He explained that if they didn't deal with the bodies promptly, their children, families, and even the entire city of Unju would be in grave danger, he urged them to reveal the location of the bodies. Unaware of the impending danger, the villagers calmly stated that the bodies were buried beneath their feet. Li Chang and his group looked around in horror. The sun was setting, and darkness was approaching. They prepared their weapons for battle. At that moment, the villagers noticed movement in the reed marsh. They saw the buried bodies writhing mysteriously. Suddenly, a zombie emerged from the ground and attacked one of the villagers, biting him. The villager picked up a sickle and struck the zombie, but it had no effect. It was only when Li Chang swiftly severed its throat that it stopped moving. A louder commotion arose from the grass, indicating that all the zombies were coming back to life. Li Chang told the villagers that if they wanted to survive, they had to decapitate the creatures. Once again, everyone prepared for the impending battle. With a beastly roar, the zombies emerged from the underground and charged at the crowd. The villagers, inexperienced in combat, became easy prey for the zombies. However, a new wave of zombies emerged from the ground, intensifying the fight. The group fought with all their might, finally managing to eliminate the large number of zombies. As the sun set, another wave of zombies rushed towards them. Li Chang, exhausted, collapsed on the ground, just as they were about to become zombie food. A rocket flew in and saved him. A group of well-trained soldiers in white robes emerged from the reed marsh. It was as if they already knew the weaknesses of the zombies. They skillfully aimed their blades at the zombies' necks, swiftly slaughtering them all. After the battle, Li Chang recognized the person who saved him. It was his teacher, An Haiyan. An Haiyan and his soldiers paid their respects to Li Chang before everyone returned to the city of Anju. Li Chang recounted everything that had happened in Dongni to An Haiyan, including the conspiracy orchestrated by Prime Minister Zhou Hakjo. He hoped that his teacher would help him return to Hanyan and eliminate the treacherous Zhou Hakjo. However, An Haiyan remained calm and advised the crown prince to take some rest. He emphasized that a true leader must always maintain composure, and as the future of the nation, the crown prince must not lose sight of his responsibilities. Outside the room, Seo Bai found the situation suspicious and asked Mu Yang about An Haiyan's character. She was curious why he remained so composed upon encountering the zombies for the first time and why he swiftly decapitated them without hesitation. It seemed like he had a deep understanding of these creatures and even knew how to burn them effectively. Her words triggered a realization in Mu Young. When the crown prince emerged from An Haiyan's room, Mu Young informed him of Seo Bai's suspicions and questioned whether An Haiyan had promised to help him. He believed that, at such a critical moment, the crown prince should not easily trust anyone. After all, it had been over a decade since he had last seen An Haiyan, and he had not left Anju during all those years, making it possible that he was in league with Zhou Hak Zhou. Reluctant to doubt his teacher, Li Chang, exhausted, went directly to his room to rest. Meanwhile, in Hanyang, Zhou Hak Zhou conducted experiments on prisoners and discovered that anyone bitten by a zombie would quickly turn into one. Now it is necessary to prevent everyone from heading north in order to contain the virus outside the city. The next day, he used the queen's authority to issue a decree. Firstly, he dispatched the central army to take control of Anju's defenses and capture the traitorous crown prince. Secondly, he ordered the closure of all northbound passages, threatening anyone attempting to go north with severe consequences. By preventing people from heading north, Zhou Hakjo condemned hundreds of thousands of people in the southernmost region of Anju to be trapped in a raging inferno. Yet, this was just the beginning of Zhou Hakjo's conspiracy. Even if he couldn't capture the crown prince, he intended to trap him within Anju, preventing his return to Hanyang. News arrived that the governor of Anju, who had received the orders from Zhou Hakjo, had come to An Haiyan's residence, seeking to apprehend the criminal crown prince in order to ensure the safety of all the people in Anju. This time, An Haiyan did not intervene. In the meantime, the magistrate of Dongni, who had also received the news, quickly packed his belongings and sought out Seo Bai, whom he owed his life to. He wanted Seo Bai to accompany him in escaping, as they would surely face dire consequences by staying with a crown prince accused of treason. Seo Bai, without hesitation, refused his offer. She believed that people like Cho Biampal had no conscience. The crown prince risked his life to save him, but now he wants to escape without gratitude. She told Cho Biampal to go ahead and escape if he wanted, then turned and left. Cho Biampal started to hesitate and followed Seo Bai back. On the other side, the army chasing the crown prince arrived at An Haiyan's residence. Li Chang stepped out of the room, preparing for a final resistance. At this moment, An Haiyan arrived with the governor of Anju. 
Facing Joe Hakjo with a sense of caution, the leader of the royal guard arrogantly declared that he was following orders and would escort the crown prince back to Hanyang as a criminal. He then ordered the royal guard to take action, Mu Young was the first to step forward and protect the crown prince, followed by An Haiyan speaking up. He questioned who the real traitor to the nation was. As members of the royal guard, they should defend the country and protect the royal family. But now, driven by personal greed, they have become Joe Hakjo's lackeys and even dare to harm the crown prince, who is the foundation of the nation. They should be executed. Following on Haiyan's command, archers who had already been positioned on the rooftops aimed their arrows at the leader and released them. In an instant, all the royal guard soldiers fell to the ground. The leader of the royal guard attempted a final resistance but was swiftly struck down by the crown prince's sword. This meant that on Haiyan had ultimately sided with the crown prince, signifying that they had completely offended Joe Hakjo. The governor of Anju was caught in a dilemma, observing the scene. At that moment, a subordinate arrived and reported that a large number of refugees had gathered outside the city of Anju. These refugees were mostly from the surrounding counties, towns, and villages, which had already been overrun by zombies. Based on the current situation, the zombies would likely reach the outskirts of Anju tonight. The crown prince told the governor of Anju that they must open the city gates to let the refugees in to save their lives. However, the governor of Anju directly refused. He stated that the northbound passages had already been closed, and there would be more refugees to come. They had no capacity to accommodate them within the city. With so many refugees flooding in, how would they eat and find shelter? Once the food ran out, people would start looting, causing panic within the city, but the crown prince refused to let these refugees abandon their lives. No matter how he tried to persuade the governor of Anju, he was unwilling to accept them. Left with no choice, the crown prince used his authority to dismiss the governor of Anju and took full control of Anju, opening the city gates to welcome all the refugees inside. Facing the approaching horde of zombies, the crown prince, who understood their characteristics, quickly ordered the entire city of Anju to be surrounded by water barriers. By guarding the two designated checkpoints, he believed that they could protect the entire city of Anju. Everyone joined forces and began preparing for the defense. They cut bamboo to make weapons and set up defenses on the paths that the zombies would inevitably pass through. Meanwhile, inside the palace in Hanyang, the queen's courtyard where pregnant women were kept finally saw someone going into labor. After a night of screaming, the woman gave birth with all her strength and the other pregnant women outside the door finally breathed a sigh of relief. But just as the sound of the baby's cries filled the air, it abruptly stopped, leaving everyone curious and gathering at the door. When a palace maid came out and announced that the baby had been successfully delivered, the other pregnant women asked eagerly if it was a boy or a girl. Disappointed by the answer that it was a girl, they left. Inside the room, another palace maid was cleaning up the bloodstains. It was clear that the queen had not achieved her goal of killing the women and babies after childbirth, waiting for the next pregnant woman to deliver. Meanwhile, in another part of the palace, the apartment where the queen resided was being cleaned, but a servant accidentally knocked over a water basin. The water almost splashed onto the queen's undergarments, reminding her of something she had seen before. The queen recalled that her personal maid had thrown a blood-stained undergarment into the fire, reducing it to ashes. She fantasized about wearing such valuable silk once in her life, thinking it would be worth dying for. Little did she know that their conversation had been overheard by the queen. Facing such a gossiping maid, the queen naturally did not want to let her go easily. So, that evening, she sent the young maid to serve her during her bath. The maid carefully undressed the queen, but the scene she witnessed in the next second made her panic and kneel on the spot. She saw the secret on the queen's abdomen, and it turned out to be the reason why the queen's undergarments were stained with blood. As for her fate, there was only one way out death. Meanwhile, in the city of Anju, Cho Biampal from Dongni tried to win Siobai's favor by voluntarily going into the mountains to dig for herbs. Unfortunately, after much effort, all he managed to dig up were wild grasses. With no other choice, Siobai ventured into the mountains again to search for the herbs. It was during this search that she stumbled upon the fabled frozen valley mentioned by her master. Inside, she indeed found the resurrection plant that could bring people back from the dead. And at that moment, a figure slowly passed behind them. The sound of a rope breaking in the distance alerted their senses. As night fell, the people of Anju prepared themselves for a final, decisive battle against the zombies. Meanwhile, the royal army was stationed nearby. Observing Li Chang and his group in Anju, Prime Minister Zhou Hakjo personally took the field, determined to kill Li Chang and avenge his son. With anxious hearts, they waited through the night. But what awaited them was not only the zombies but also the central army. 
However, as the dawn gradually broke, the zombies did not appear. Only then did the people begin to relax and prepare to return for rest and recovery. But then, a loud noise came from the nearby valley. A large flock of crows flew overhead, bringing a sense of foreboding. Even the water on the ground began to tremble. Everyone stared at the swaying forest in the distance, their faces filled with fear. On the other side, Siobai and Cho Pal found themselves surrounded by zombies at the mountain cave. Fortunately, the nearby water source temporarily hindered the zombies' movements. Siobai finally understood that these zombies were not afraid of sunlight but of temperature. A bloody and fierce battle was about to unfold in the city of Anjou. The city of Anjou prepared for a decisive battle with the zombies on this dark night. But to their surprise, there was no movement from the zombies. As the sun gradually rose, everyone believed that the calamity was over. They slowly let their guard down, put away their weapons, and prepared to return to the city. However, at that moment, they heard a commotion coming from the nearby woods. A large flock of crows flew across the sky, signaling that danger was silently approaching. Fear and panic filled the faces of the people as a horde of zombies surged towards Anjo. Everyone couldn't believe their eyes. The zombies were able to move and attack during daylight. The exhausted defenders, who had remained vigilant throughout the night, now faced an overwhelming number of zombies. They were caught off guard and scrambled to defend themselves. However, they had already put down their guard after sunrise, and many of their defenses were no longer usable. The zombie horde was now less than 10 meters away from them, and they could only fight back while retreating. Fortunately, the makeshift traps they had set up temporarily held off the zombies, keeping them at bay. But this could only last for a few minutes before the traps were filled with zombies. They were forced to take refuge in their fortified structures and attack the zombies from above. However, the massive wave of zombies relentlessly crashed against the defense walls they had built, putting them in imminent danger. On the other side, the archers stationed at the riverbank hadn't even had time to row their boats when the zombies were already upon them. Unfortunately, they were all wiped out. Inside the defensive structures, various weapons were hastily supplied to the defenders. People within the defenses quickly manned the cannons, but before they could fire, the zombies were already at their doorstep. The excessive tension almost caused friendly fire incidents, and the few cannon shots that were launched had no effect. Realizing the dire situation, Li Chang immediately ordered everyone to retreat from the defense walls while continuing to fight. Soon, the hastily constructed defense walls were breached in multiple places, and most of the people who had engaged the zombies became their prey. Without hesitation, Mu Young swiftly killed those who were bitten to prevent them from turning. In the end, the remaining people quickly rode their horses and fled towards the city, while the defense walls behind them were overrun in an instant. On the other side, Yang Xin and a small group managed to escape the onslaught and took refuge on a boat. However, they discovered that one person on the boat had been accidentally bitten by a zombie. Without hesitation, the man rowing the boat threw him into the river. Now, they had no choice but to row towards the direction of Anjou City, as staying out on the water until nightfall would result in freezing to death. On the other side, Li Chine and the others managed to escape from the defense walls. However, the zombies had already crossed their path and reached the outskirts of Anjou City. They could no longer return through the main gates into the city. A large horde of zombies continued to relentlessly chase after them. In this critical situation, An Haiyan remembered the existence of a secret tunnel that led directly into the city. However, it hadn't been used for many years, and they were uncertain if it was still passable. Nevertheless, they had no other options, and everyone ran towards the secret tunnel. Meanwhile, Yang Xin and his group, who had arrived by boat, met up with Li Chang and the others. However, when they reached the entrance of the secret tunnel, they discovered it had been locked, and they had no idea when it had happened. Acting quickly, Li Chang ordered the people outside to fortify their defenses, using even the most makeshift weapons like sharp sticks to fend off the pursuing zombies. This bought some time for the person trying to unlock the door. However, no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't force open the sturdy door lock. It was only when Mu Young intervened that they were able to successfully unlock it. Unfortunately, due to years of neglect, the ceiling above them collapsed. As everyone rushed into the secret tunnel, they found that no matter what they did, the door wouldn't close. In that moment, An Haiyan's assistant pushed Yang Chen inside. It turned out that he had been bitten by a zombie during the previous defense. In a final act of sacrifice, he used his body to firmly secure the door lock, ensuring everyone's safety. Everyone watched him with resolute eyes as he spoke his final words, instructing them to protect the prince. Then, he used a dagger to pierce his own body. The massive horde of zombies behind him once again swarmed in, 
devouring his lifeless form, reluctantly, everyone retreated into the secret tunnel, their hearts heavy with grief. Yang Xin, unable to bear witnessing his suffering, took out his dagger, intending to end his pain. The man, in his final moments, looked at Yang Xin and uttered an apology. Yang Xin, unable to face him directly, ended his life. The group of survivors who managed to escape returned to the city. The accompanying officials were puzzled and questioned the prince, wondering why the zombies launched an attack during daylight. Li Chang himself was also bewildered, not understanding the underlying cause. On the other side, Xiao Bai, trapped inside a cave surrounded by zombies, managed to climb up the rock wall with great difficulty. There was another person lagging behind, seeking help. Exhausted, they sat on the rock, completely drained of energy. The magistrate, observing the ravenous zombies below, anxiously asked Seo Bai what was happening and why the zombies could now emerge during the day. Seo Bai speculated that the resurrection plant, Bellflower, was a cool-tempered herb. The infected zombies caused by the plant exhibited similar characteristics. They were not afraid of sunlight but disliked rising temperatures. Even though it was past the winter solstice, the sun still rose in a chilling manner, allowing the zombies to appear during the day. Fortunately, they were saved earlier due to the presence of a water source that acted as a barrier. Seobai also noticed that the number of zombies hadn't increased from yesterday until now, indicating that there were only a limited number of zombies in the vicinity. Returning to the city was now impossible for them. The safest place seemed to be the suburban military camp where Cho Hakjo resided. Seobai remembered hearing Cho Biam Pal mention that he was affiliated with Cho Hakjo. Therefore, they presumed Cho Hakjo wouldn't harm them. Meanwhile, chaos gripped Hansung City. As everyone had heard about the events in Anzhou, people continuously set up defenses and offered prayers in front of their homes. The magistrate in charge of the investigation was summoned to a secret chamber, where numerous corpses were laid out. His subordinate reported that they found these women near the palace gates yesterday. Curiously, all the women had recently given birth, and their babies were left abandoned beside them. Strangely, all the babies were girls. Among these women, one was still alive when they discovered them. She claimed that someone in her place of residence had been harming her and the other women who gave birth, killing them all. The place she mentioned was none other than the queen's quarters. The matter involved the queen and the influential Zhao family backing her. The subordinate didn't dare to take matters into his own hands and reported the situation to his superior. Meanwhile, inside the queen's sleeping quarters, a shaman was conducting a ritual in the hopes of granting her a male child. Outside the door, Palace maids reported that the staff at the Pavilion of Operations had discovered a secret in the quarters and were preparing to investigate. They needed to seek help from the Prime Minister, who was currently in Anzhou. However, the Queen refused, as she didn't want her father to find out about the fake pregnancy. She believed that once she gave birth to a prince, no one, including the staff at the Pavilion of Operations, would be able to threaten her. Soon, the shaman completed the ritual and brought her good news. Before the waning crescent moon disappeared at the end of the month, she should prepare an altar for an early offering to the mountain god. On that day, she would hold her own son in her arms, and the queen smiled with satisfaction. On the other side, Seobai and Cho Biampal arrived at Zhou Hakjo's military camp. A large flock of crows circled above and refused to disperse. The guards recognized Cho Biampal's Zhao family emblem and allowed him entry. He kneeled before Zhou Hakjo and disclosed the details of the situation. Surprisingly, Cho Biampal turned out to be Zhou Hakjo's nephew, and Zhou Hakjo had personally appointed him as the magistrate in Dongni. However, his useless nephew had never handled any matters properly, and he was unaware that his own son had been killed in Dongni. Although Zhou Hakjo currently had no regard for his nephew, he recognized that the nephew was the only bloodline of the Zhao family and decided to let him stay for now while considering his next move. Upon learning that Seobai was a former disciple of An Hyun, Zhou Hakjo also allowed her to stay. Back in Anzhou, the people were still in a state of high tension, gathering together to discuss their next steps. Given the current situation, even if they rationed their food, it would only last for about five days. On the way back, the subordinates began chatting about An Hyun. It turned out that they had encountered a similar situation three years ago. However, at that time, the zombies' bites didn't transmit the infection, and they didn't continue their activities after sunrise as they do now. They wondered if Joe Hakjo deliberately concealed this information from them or if it was the price paid for using the resurrection plant, Bellflower. An Hyun expressed that even if they could go back three years, he wouldn't regret his actions. It was revealed that during the previous war against the Japanese invaders three years ago, 
Zhou Hakjo had inquired about the effects of the resurrection plant from An Hyun. An Hyun explained that the herb could revive recently deceased individuals, but it had no effect on those with brain damage. The resurrected individuals would become like monsters, with a bloodthirsty craving for human flesh. Zhou Hakjo didn't hesitate and immediately sought out An Hyun. An Hyun had no other options. In the numerous wars against the Japanese invaders, they had reached a desperate situation. They were left with fewer than 500 people while the Japanese invaders had 30,000. Finally, An Hyun agreed to use the resurrection plant. This led to the legendary battle of 500 against 30,000. However, their conversation was secretly overheard by Mu Young, who reported it to the crown prince. It was evident that there was a secret between An Hyun and Zhou Hakjo. Once again, Zhou Hakjo expressed suspicion towards An Hyun believing that they should quickly escort the crown prince away to the safe territory of Biakshin. The crown prince questioned why Mu Yun repeatedly tried to sow discord between him and An Hyun. Suspecting that Zhou Hakjo had given Mu Yun some benefit, he had long suspected that the imperial army knew his every move because of Mu Yun's reports. Mu Yun appeared aggrieved, having left his heavily pregnant wife to accompany the crown prince to this remote location for his safety, only to be doubted by the crown prince. While they argued, someone shouted that there was a fire. Unfortunately, the fire broke out at the food storage warehouse. By the time everyone arrived and extinguished the fire, all the food had been burned. The leader of the soldiers was so angry that he wanted to chop off the hand of the patrol guard. At that moment, a nobleman stepped forward from the crowd and confessed that he was responsible. He couldn't bear to see the children continue to starve. So he tried to steal a bag of rice but accidentally knocked over an oil lamp, causing the tragedy. He was willing to sacrifice his life as an apology. However, Everyone present was stunned. They knew that even if they killed the man, it wouldn't solve the problem. The only solution now was to go to Biakshin through Zhou Hakjo's military camp in the north. There was a river between Biakshin and Anjo that could block all the zombies. Once they crossed to the other side, they would be safe. However, it was incredibly challenging to pass through the Central Army Station there. Li Chang immediately made a decision to lead an elite squad to secretly infiltrate the military camp and assassinate Zhou Hakjo. Only when he was dead could the crown prince truly take command of the army. They lowered a rope ladder from the city wall to attract the zombies with the fresh blood of the living, causing them to gather in one area. Meanwhile, the crown prince led his elite squad to escape through the secret passage they had entered before. They settled on Hyun's subordinates and then rushed towards Zhou Hakjo's military camp. Inside the camp, Siobai was studying the resurrection plant. She wanted to find a way to counteract its effects and cure the current epidemic. However, their conversation was overheard by Zhou Hakjo. Under Zhou Hakjo's interrogation, Seo Bai finally admitted that she had obtained her master's medical records to understand everything. She knew that the great king was already dead and understood that only by injecting the juice of the resurrection plant into the forehead with a silver needle could the plant take effect. Zhou Hakjo spared her for now, seeing that she also understood the usage of the resurrection plant. Seo Bai unable to sleep late at night, went out for a walk and unexpectedly saw many soldiers carrying a large box. This box was brought by Zhou Hakjo from the capital. After the soldiers left, she cautiously opened the box and froze in place. The huge box was filled with bloodstains but no zombies. It was evident that the zombies inside had already been released. In the late hours of the night, Li Chang and his group finally arrived at the Central Army camp. They carefully entered and investigated, while the crown prince headed straight to Zhou Hakjo's residence. He was determined to eliminate this treacherous minister, and the others infiltrated the camp, preparing to create chaos. Yang Xin, who took the initiative, realized that something was wrong after dealing with several soldiers. The once crowded military camp during the day was now empty, and he understood that everyone had fallen into a trap. Meanwhile, the crown prince, escorted by Mu Yun, had already entered Zhou Hakjo's residence. In his irrational state, he failed to notice the sparsely guarded surroundings as he rushed towards the room. However, as soon as he entered the room, the door was closed behind him, and a figure approached him. A zombie broke through the door and charged at the crown prince, revealing itself to be none other than his own father, the king. It turned out that it was all part of Zhou Hakjo's scheme. He had long planted his loyal followers around Li Chang, gathering information about his every move. Upon learning about Li Chang's plan to launch a night raid on the military camp, Zhou Hakjo had orchestrated this grand deception in advance. The crown prince couldn't bring himself to kill his own father, and he desperately tried to escape from the room, but it was already locked. Zhou Hakjo stood outside the door, his plan flawlessly executed. If Li Chang killed his own father, he would forever bear the guilt of regicide and be unable to inherit the throne. But if he didn't kill, 
he would meet his demise here, no matter who died. Cho Hakjo would be the one to benefit in the end. As Li Chang struggled to break free inside the room, he had a fleeting vision of his father approaching him. He recalled his father's words when he was a child, urging him to live on as a strong and brave man. At that moment, on high and arrived just in time, Cho Hakjo, using the king's name as a pretext, claimed that the king himself would personally deal with the rebellious crown prince, forbidding anyone from entering. However, on Hai knew that it was all part of Zhou Hakjo's scheme and walked straight towards the room. Zhou Hakjo ordered his men to shoot on Hian, but everyone hesitated due to their fear and admiration for on Hian's past military achievements. Enraged, Zhou Hakjo personally struck down the leader who hesitated. Only then did the others gather the courage to open fire. On Hian, using his last ounce of strength, managed to unlock the door. Inside, the crown prince had already beheaded the king. He crawled towards the crown prince whispered a final message about an escape route, and then died. Cho Hakjo then began his performance, pretending to be heartbroken. He wrapped the king's head in a red cloth and, in front of many soldiers, accused the crown prince of killing the king. Helpless, the crown prince was unable to refute the accusations. The elite squad led by the crown prince, along with the crown prince himself, were all captured in plain sight. At this moment, inside the Hanyang Palace, the magistrate led a group of people to search the queen's private residence. However, the queen had already received the news in advance, and six sedan chairs were carried out of the courtyard. The passing magistrate didn't pay attention and proceeded to search the queen's residence. After searching around, they found no pregnant women but discovered bloodstains under the carpet. It was then that the magistrate remembered the large boxes that had been carried out earlier and immediately rushed after them with his men. However, they only found three of the boxes, and upon opening them, they discovered the bodies of murdered women and children. From the evidence, it appeared that the women had been stabbed after giving birth, and the children had been strangled. Furthermore, all the children were girls. The magistrate speculated that the person behind this must be in need of a male child. But before he could fully understand the situation, he received the news of the emperor's death, and the entire nation was filled with grief. Cho Hak Jo, in the meantime, hastily wrote down the crown prince's crimes and prepared to bring the crown prince and others back to Hanyang for questioning and execution. Inside the Hanyang palace, after the king's death, numerous ministers gathered to discuss the succession to the throne. However, with the crown prince proven guilty of killing the king, he could no longer inherit the throne. Some ministers supported the child born to the queen as the future successor to the country, while others supported the descendants of the emperor's younger brother, the Duke of Lu. To ascend the throne, the debates grew heated, and ultimately, they decided to determine the succession based on whether the child born to the queen was a boy or a girl. At this moment, Eunuchs brought news that the queen was experiencing labor pains and about to give birth. However, the one giving birth in the queen's chamber was not the queen herself but a woman living next to her. It turned out that the queen had anticipated the magistrate's search and had the woman taken away after they finished searching the chamber. However, the series of murders of women raised suspicions among the officials, and the chief inspector secretly approached the magistrate, hoping he would continue investigating the matter, but they needed to find clues before the queen gave birth. On the other hand, the crown prince, imprisoned and haunted by the shadow of killing his own father, couldn't escape his guilt. Siobai took the opportunity to bring him food and check on him. The crown prince used water to write crucial information on the ground and asked Siobai to help him with a task, to which she nodded in agreement. Meanwhile, the people in prison in the jail also realized that there must be a traitor who had leaked their plans, resulting in the premature knowledge of their actions, they couldn't sit idly by, as once they were taken to Hanyang, everyone would face execution. Yangshan expressed that his marksmanship was accurate and that he could find an opportunity to escape and kill Zhou Hak Zhou. The others agreed with his plan. Later, Yangshan took out a small knife from his sleeve and cut the ropes while the soldiers were preparing to escort them back to Hanyang. When the moment came, they overpowered several soldiers together and rushed out. Yangshan obtained the hunting rifle he desired and headed straight for Zhou Hakjo. Zhou Hakjo ordered to execute all the escaped criminals on the spot. Yangshan loaded his gun, aimed at Zhou Hakjo, and pulled the trigger. The gunshot echoed throughout the camp. Zhou Hakjo stood there, covered in blood, although Yangshan thought he hit him. Fortunately, a nearby soldier took the bullet instead. This shot terrified Zhou Hakjo. Realizing he narrowly escaped death, Yang Xin, who missed his chance, was captured again by Zhou Hak Zhou's men. The crown prince was also brought out, and at that moment, another unexpected event occurred. Zombies seemed to attack from a distance. A zombie, 
with military flags impaled on its body, walked towards them it was on Hyan, who had died. Everyone was stunned, except for the crown prince, who seemed to have known in advance. So what was happening? Why did on Hyan, who died from a gunshot, turn into a zombie? It turned out that before his death, on Hyan had told the crown prince that he wanted to become a zombie. Only by reappearing in front of the entire army could he prove that the crown prince didn't kill the king and expose Zhou Hakjo's conspiracy. It was the last thing he could do for the crown prince. Meanwhile, the crown prince had left a message for Seo Bai on the floor of the prison cell, asking her to use resurrection plan to help revive on Hyan. The zombified on Hyan, smelling the blood on Zhou Hakjo, charged at him without hesitation. Zhou Hakjo ordered his men to aim for the head. But the arrow shot by the archers didn't hit any headshots. In the end, on Hyan bit off a piece of flesh from Joe Hakjo's face. It was the crown prince who finally stepped in and beheaded his former mentor, putting an end to the chaos. The events unfolded too quickly for anyone to react. The crown prince declared in front of everyone that these monsters could only be stopped by severing their heads. Then, Seobai explained the role of the resurrection plant and revealed the fact that the king had already passed away. All of this was part of Joe Hakjo's conspiracy to seize the throne. The entire imperial army witnessed these events and pledged their loyalty to the crown prince. Their immediate task was to rescue the people trapped in Sangju city and deliver food to them. With the crown prince leading the way, the army engaged in a war against the zombies. They used artillery fire to clear a path for the food supply convoy. They also used kites to determine the position of the convoy and attack the zombies approaching the convoy. Meanwhile, the people inside the city noticed the food supply convoy approaching and provided timely assistance. Fortunately, the food reached Sangju city without any major incidents, and the temporary crisis of the people was resolved. On the other hand, Seo Bai, unable to see someone die without offering help, assisted in treating Joe Hakjo's wounds. Cho Biampal cautiously approached Seo Bai and asked if Joe Hakjo would soon turn into a zombie. Seo Bai replied that it was uncertain because Cho Hakjo was directly bitten by An Hyan, who had consumed the resurrection plant. It should be similar to the case of the assistant getting bitten by the king, which only resulted in a coma and slow death without any contagious effects. The contagious zombies were created when they consumed the decaying flesh of the assistant. Although Cho Hakjo did not have contagious properties, his symptoms were extremely dangerous. His body had started to turn cold, and he had even lost consciousness. Cho Biam Pal pleaded with Seo Bai to save his uncle. Although Seo Bai was reluctant, she also saw this as an opportunity to study the properties of the resurrection plant. She needed to find some herbs to control Cho Hak Jo's condition. At that moment, Cho Biam Pal remembered the medicinal herbs he had brought from Dongni. These herbs were very precious and were originally meant for the queen, as she frequently consumed them. Seo Bai took the herbs from his hand and discovered that they were mugwort. However, mugwort was a herb used to alleviate postpartum depression in women and had no effect on Joe Hakjo's symptoms. This puzzled her because the queen was already pregnant. So why would she consume such herbs? Just then, the door to the room was opened, and a guard named Mu Young entered. It turned out that he was a spy who had been hiding by Li Chang's side. Taking advantage of the crown prince's absence from the camp, he used the crown prince's name to take Seo Bai, Cho Hakjo, and the others away. When the crown prince returned from his inspection, he found that everyone had disappeared. Consumed by anger and betrayal from his closest ally, he was furious. In truth, he had known from the beginning that Mu Young was a spy, but due to their long-standing relationship, he couldn't bring himself to eliminate him. But now, because of his soft-heartedness, the situation was becoming increasingly dire. If Mu Young were to bring Zhou Hakjo back to Hanseong, the Central Army would undoubtedly launch another attack. Plunging the country back into war, without much time to think, he immediately led Yan Shin and others in pursuit. Mu Yun was forced to act the way he did out of desperation. His wife had been taken by Zhou Hakjo's son and was now being held captive with other pregnant women in the queen's custody. If he didn't follow the orders of the Zhao family, his wife and unborn child would be killed. In the prison in Hanseong, the magistrate was interrogating the queen's palace maid, trying to extract information about the pregnant women. However, the palace maid was loyal to the queen and refused to utter a word, no matter how much torture was inflicted upon her. Meanwhile, a report came in that some witnesses had seen six sedan chairs being carried out from the palace last night, but only three sedan chairs were found. The other three sedan chairs were believed to be in the queen's palace. Without hesitation, they searched the queen's sleeping quarters and found the three sedan chairs. The palace maid tried to explain that they were used by the wet nurses attending to the queen's delivery the previous night, but the magistrate refused to believe her. When he ordered her to open the room's door, 
They discovered three actual wet nurses inside. It was then that he realized he had fallen into the queen's trap, and he himself was arrested for trespassing into the queen's chambers, with the magistrate captured. The guards who were watching over the queen were also recalled. The queen's plan was reaching its final stages. On the other side, Seo Bai and the others, rushing to catch up, noticed that Joe Hakjo's condition was worsening rapidly. If they didn't treat him soon, he might die before they reached Hanseong. So, after discussing with Mu Young, they found a temporary refuge in an abandoned room to rest. When Joe Hakjo regained consciousness, he quietly said something to Cho Biam Pal which caught Seo Bai's attention. She also sensed that something was off about Mu Young, suspecting that he was acting behind the crown prince's back. She told Mu Young that they needed to return to the crown prince immediately because she had something important to tell him. However, Mu Young ignored her pleas, left with no choice. Seo Bai shared her suspicions with Mu Young and showed him the medicinal herbs given by Cho Biam Pal. She revealed that the queen had been consuming these herbs, which were used to treat postpartum depression a big taboo for pregnant women. Seobai explained that the queen was either not pregnant or had already miscarried. Upon hearing this, Mu Young recalled seeing numerous pregnant women in the annex when he took his wife to the queen's chambers. He wondered what exactly the queen was plotting. He couldn't help but start worrying about his wife's safety. At that moment, the sound of hooves could be heard outside the door, just as Mu Young was about to go out and investigate. He was struck by a hidden arrow that pierced through, and a group of imperial guards stormed in. These were the reinforcements ordered by Zhou Hak Zhou, whom Cho Biam Pal had gone to fetch. They took away the injured Zhou Hak Zhou and, while Mu Young was wounded, a knife was plunged into his abdomen. Despite his injuries, Mu Young still wanted to continue the pursuit but was pierced by more hidden arrows shot from outside the window, leaving him severely injured and collapsing to the ground. His last hope was that Seo Bai would go to Hanseon with Cho Biam Pal and investigate the truth while protecting his wife, who was imprisoned in the palace. Seo Bai promised him, and with his last breath, Mu Young crawled into the nearby woods. At that moment, the crown prince arrived just in time. Little did they know that this would be their final meeting under such circumstances. Mu Young expressed his apologies to the crown prince and pleaded for him to save his wife. He also shared Seo Bai's suspicions about the hidden truth behind the queen's pregnancy before succumbing to his deep-seated resentment. Meanwhile, inside the palace, his wife was in labor, and with her last ounce of strength, she finally gave birth to a baby boy. This baby boy would also be used by the queen. Soon, Seo Bai and the others returned to Hanseon under the escort of the Imperial Guards. However, Cho Hak Jo's condition was deteriorating, and neither medicine nor acupuncture seemed to have any effect on him. Cho Biam Pal pleaded with Seo Bai to find a way to save him, recalling that the zombies had a strong aversion to water, even avoiding shallow rivers in the valleys. Seo Bai speculated that water might temporarily alleviate Cho Hak Jo's symptoms. Together, they submerged Cho Hak Jo into the water. However, when Cho Hak Jo's wound came into contact with the water, he resisted fiercely. After struggling for a moment, he fell unconscious again, confirming Seo Bai's suspicion. With a bold decision, Seo Bai pressed Cho Hak Jo into the water. Cho Biam Pal, who was standing nearby, thought she was trying to kill him and immediately called for help. But something unexpected happened in the water the wound on Cho Hak Jo's body began to heal rapidly. Within moments, several insects emerged from the wound clearly carriers of the zombie virus. Meanwhile, outside the queen's private quarters, a group of people was dealing with the women who had not yet given birth. Although the queen no longer needed them, the situation was being handled. At that moment, the crown prince and his men arrived, quickly subduing the queen's guards, witnessing the brutal killings and the preparation to bury the pregnant women in a pit. The crown prince realized the extent of his stepmother's cruelty. From a nearby room, they heard a woman's screams and rushed in. They swiftly overpowered a burly man who was about to strangle the woman, and it turned out to be Mu Young's wife whom they had saved. Meanwhile, news of the queen giving birth spread within the palace. All the ministers who supported the queen displayed expressions of joy, kneeling both inside and outside the queen's chambers to show their loyalty. It was then that the crown prince realized that the reason the queen had captured so many pregnant women was to use them as surrogates. The next day, Cho Hak Jo regained consciousness and resumed his killing spree. He captured all the families of the Imperial Guards who had sided with the Crown Prince, planning to publicly execute them the day after tomorrow. Among those captured was the magistrate whom they had asked to investigate before. At the same time, Seo Bai, who had gone out to buy medicine, unintentionally encountered Yan Shin. Yan Shin took her to a secluded academy outside the city where everyone had gathered to draw attention away from themselves. They had already rescued Mu Young's wife 
but she was now weak due to childbirth. She was suffering from a high fever and pleaded with Siobai to save her. Under Siobai's treatment, the woman's life was temporarily out of danger, but her mental state was not good. She told Siobai that her child had been taken away. Siobai knew that it was the queen's doing and explained the properties of the resurrection plant to the crown prince. The plant itself didn't turn people into zombies, but it carried special insect eggs on its surface. Once these insects entered the human body, they would resurrect and control the person's behavior. However, Siobai hadn't found a solution yet. To avoid exposing the whereabouts of the crown prince and the others, Siobai had to temporarily return to Joe Hakjo's side. The next day, Joe Hakjo took Siobai with him to the queen's chamber. Although Joe Hakjo and the queen were father and daughter, their relationship had long been strained. Now he doubted the truth of the queen's pregnancy and asked Siobai to examine her pulse. Despite the queen's repeated avoidance, she couldn't resist her father's persistence. So, Siobai took her pulse and discovered that the queen had not given birth. While Joe Hakjo was power hungry, he had his own principles. That means the person who ascends to the throne must have royal blood. Joe Hakjo plans to support the emperor's younger brother, Prince Wusong, to take the throne and kill everyone who knows about the queen's false pregnancy. The queen will spend the rest of her life in exile in the cold palace. After saying all this, Joe Hakjo prepares to leave. However, before taking a few steps, he coughs up blood and collapses to the ground. Joe Hakjo, who had schemed his entire life, never expected to die by the hands of his own daughter's plot. With Joe Hakjo's death, all the power in the country will fall into the hands of the queen. She takes Siobai to a dungeon where zombies are kept, and they are highly infectious. It is clear that the queen has a bigger conspiracy at play, seeing that tomorrow is the day to order the execution of the families of the imperial guards who follow the crown prince. They must come up with a solution quickly. On the other side, Cho Biam Pal, after completing Joe Hakjo's funeral, is summoned to the palace by the queen, as they are the only remaining bloodline of the Cho family. The queen appoints Cho Biam Pal as the new magistrate. Cho Biam Pal immediately bows in gratitude and asks the queen about Siobai's whereabouts. However, his limited intelligence is quickly dismissed by the queen. Meanwhile, the crown prince returns to Unju overnight and gathers his imperial guards to prepare for an attack on Hanyang to rescue people. However, the commander of the imperial guards appears outside the queen's palace. He reports the whereabouts of the crown prince and his men to the queen hoping to exchange this information for the lives of his own family. Soon, the queen sends her men to the academy outside the city, intending to assassinate the crown prince. But when the imperial guards storm into the academy, they find it empty. The crown prince and his men have already entered Hanyang city. Now everything is part of the crown prince's plan. He deliberately sent the commander of the imperial guards to defect, made the queen send people to pursue them, and took the opportunity to have the remaining imperial guards infiltrate the city. Soon, the crown prince and his imperial guards take control of Hanyang city and head straight to the execution site to rescue the people. However, by the time they arrive, the scheduled execution time has passed, and the newly appointed magistrate, Cho Biam Pal, who is in charge, hasn't made a move. Although Cho Biam Pal may be foolish, he has a kind heart. Seeing the women and children kneeling on the ground, he knows they are innocent and cannot bear to make such a decision. At that moment, he sees the crown prince approaching, and feeling wronged, he kneels down, he is willing to follow the crown prince, and the crown prince also commends his final line of integrity. Subsequently, everyone follows the crown prince and storms into the palace. Even the ministers inside the palace are in disarray. Seeing the crown prince and the imperial guards approaching, they open the city gates and switch sides. They all kneel before the crown prince, expressing their willingness to support his ascension to the throne. The crown prince, accompanied by his followers, proceeds towards the grand hall of the palace. Meanwhile, the queen, dressed in ceremonial attire, holds her child on the throne. Even facing imminent death, she remains calm. It turns out that she had anticipated such an outcome and had a trump card up her sleeve. At the same time, the queen's maids who were loyal to her also take action. They release the zombies kept in the dungeon. Seo Bai, blindfolded and bound, is held captive in another room in the prison. She listens to the constant roar of the beasts nearby. Filled with fear, desperately, she frees herself from the ropes that bind her and escapes from the prison. To her horror, she witnesses the palace overrun by zombies, tearing apart the officials. She rushes towards the main hall and informs the crown prince about the presence of the zombies inside the palace. 
The crown prince realizes the severity of the situation. If the zombies escape from the palace, the entire Hanyang will be in danger. He immediately orders the lockdown of all the palace gates, ensuring no zombies can get out. However, the people inside the palace, unaware of the situation, have become the zombies' prey. The zombies rapidly spread throughout the palace, from a few to dozens. The crown prince leads his loyal team in defending against the zombies inside the palace, while Seo Bai and the others hide in the main hall. All of them have become skilled in killing zombies, however, the number of zombies keeps growing, overwhelming them, they can only fight and run at the same time. Eventually, they manage to reach a gate and block the zombies outside. Taking a momentary breath, as darkness falls, the zombies, attracted by the scent of blood, start attacking the main hall. Soon, the hall is breached. Seobai remembers that these zombies fear fire and water, so she ignites a torch to ward off the zombies around her. Meanwhile, the queen sitting on the throne is surrounded by a horde of zombies. Seobai, overwhelmed and preoccupied, hears the cry of a baby nearby. Immediately, she drives away the zombies around her and moves towards the direction of the baby. She picks up the infant and then sets fire to nearby clothing, draping it over herself as she charges towards the exit. The zombies, seeing the flames, instinctively avoid them. Seobai escapes with the baby into a small room, finding temporary safety. On the other side, the crown prince and his group are in a dire situation, witnessing the main gate about to be breached by zombies. The crown prince remembers that there is a lake in the palace's backyard, it is the winter solstice, and the lake's surface has frozen over. If they can lure the zombies there and shatter the ice, they can eliminate all the zombies. The group immediately rushes towards the backyard to evade the zombies. They climb onto the rooftops. Suddenly, they cut their palms and use their blood to attract the zombies. However, Cho Biam Pal, in excruciating pain, hesitates to proceed. In the end, Yang Shin helps him. Soon, the zombies catch the scent of blood and head towards the backyard. The group successfully reaches the frozen lake. With the zombie horde closing in on them, the crown prince orders everyone to take up their firearms and start attacking the ice. However, despite firing multiple shots, the ice remains intact due to its thickness. By this time, the zombies are already upon them, forcing them to engage in close combat. However, the number of zombies far exceeds their own. Soon, the group becomes exhausted, and most of them are bitten by the zombies, including the crown prince and Yang Shin. The crown prince picks up a firearm once again and starts attacking the ice, but only manages to create a small hole. As the zombies close in, the situation becomes desperate. In his desperation, the crown prince starts pounding the ice with his bare hands, even though it results in bloodied and mangled flesh. However, the ice remains unyielding. Eventually, it is with the help of a zombie that the ice is shattered. Everyone, including the zombies, falls into the lake. Surprisingly, those who were bitten by the zombies regained their consciousness upon emerging from the lake. They all had a puzzled expression on their faces, wondering why they didn't turn into zombies after being bitten. The next day, everyone started the cleanup work, clearing the bodies of the palace zombies. Meanwhile, the crown prince found Seo by hiding under the altar of the ancestral shrine. In her arms was Mu Young's child. Looking at the baby's hand, which had been bitten, the crown prince immediately became alert. Seo Bai reassured him, saying that the baby's arm had been soaked in water, causing the worms inside to emerge without any mutation. After this incident, the entire Joseon dynasty was in a state of disarray. Most of the officials had died at the hands of the zombies, and the country was in ruins. After going through so much, the crown prince had already come to understand that the throne was ultimately a burden, seeing that only a few of his trusted allies remained by his side. He made up his mind to investigate the situation thoroughly. He made a bold decision, gathering all the surviving ministers and announcing to the world that the child was born to the queen and the late king. The ministers supported him to become the future king, while he himself would die in this epidemic. He set out to investigate the cure for the zombies and then left the palace with Yang Shin and Seo Bai. Seven years passed quickly, and the young king completed his coronation ceremony. Meanwhile, Cho Biam Pal had become the prime minister, but now, in his high position, Cho Biam Pal felt like he was walking on thin ice every day. 
with none of the joy he had when he was a county magistrate, as he was preparing to return home in his carriage. A man dressed in grass clothes approached him. Upon seeing the man, Cho Biam Pal immediately exclaimed. It turned out to be Yang Xin, who had fought alongside him in the past. He invited Yang Xin to his home, and the two of them enjoyed a drink together, remembering that Yang Xin had saved his life several times. Cho Biam Pal felt grateful and asked about the whereabouts of the crown prince and Seo Bai. Yang Xin handed him a notebook, which contained Seo Bai's research on the resurrection plant. Although the zombie virus had passed, this matter could potentially resurface. He advised Cho Biam Pal to take it seriously because they had discovered deliberate cultivation of the plant in Bukchen. Meanwhile, inside the sleeping chambers of the young king in the palace, a worm crawled across his skin. Although a new crisis was quietly looming, Seo Bai and the crown prince were investigating clues about the resurrection plant in a village. Entering a room, they found it empty, but Seo Bai discovered the plant on the floor, indicating that the village was also cultivating it. Suddenly, they heard the sound of bells outside the door, and a zombie came charging towards them. The crown prince swiftly beheaded the zombie. They were puzzled as to why the zombie had bells tied to its feet, as if it had been deliberately marked and confined. In the pitch black night, more bell sounds echoed, seemingly coming from zombies similar to the one they encountered. The group prepared themselves for a battle against the zombies.